Welcome to the Swim Swam podcast. I'm your host, Garrett McCaffrey. With us today is the new head coach of the Virginia Gator Swim Club, Ned Skinner. Ned comes to us um, from, it looks like your living room, Ned. Where are you joining us from today? I'm in my uh, sunroom uh, slash my study and a good opportunity to say hello to you and my swimming friends out there and family. And uh, Garrett, I've known you a long time, so it's great to circle back with you. Just over 10 years since I saw you on the beach, or I guess it, at uh, Pinecrest down in Florida, not quite on the beach, but uh, doing some really fun stuff down at Pinecrest um, when you were at Virginia Tech. And, um, you know, it, your coaching career stretches all the way back into the 90s in college coaching. Um, and you've been doing it for, you know, three decades, it seems like, at the college level. And just recently, stepping into uh, this new role with the Virginia Gators, what made this the right move for you right now? What made this the right position for you right now? Well, I would say, uh, Garrett, you know, I mean, I've, I just love swimming. I love young people and mentoring young people. Uh, I had a real nice gig going there at Holland University. The athletic director, Myra Sims, uh, was taking great care of me. So, I mean, I was really not where I wanted to just leave or, or be done with it. But, uh, you know, I've always admired the Gators program. You know, we live in Blacksburg, Virginia. I've been there a long time, uh, nearly 25 years. And, uh, you know, so we've, I've coached quite a few of the Gators over the years. So just have come to know the kids. And uh, really, a lot of them have come to my swim camps and clinics. So, you know, really, when the job opened up and uh, I started speaking with a guy by the name of Dan Summerlin initially. Uh, it just seemed like something to consider. You know, I never really considered club coaching as a full-time job. Um, but, you know, our, our kids and my wife are at a point right now here in Blacksburg where they're thriving. Both of our kids are, are pretty involved junior golfers. And uh, Allison is a, an attorney for the federal government. So I want to be home, Garrett. I want to be a family man. And uh, so this is a good fit, you know, for me uh, to, to really have a chance to impact as many young people as I can. I mean, I think as you go a little further into your career, you realize that's what it's all about. It's about your legacy. It's about the way people feel about you, the way you treat people, and, and ultimately helping young people figure out what it is important uh, for them and what their goals are and helping them achieve them. So the, ga the Gators really ended up being the right spot. Explain to maybe coaches who don't have a family or a coach at a club right now who is, you know, working till eight o'clock at night, what made the club position for you more family friendly? Well, that's a good question. And, and first of all, you know, I spent decades putting swimming first uh, I remember a little chat I had with Allison when we first got together, like, you know, nothing will ever come in front of making kids swim fast, helping kids swim fast. And not that I regret it. I think it's part of our, our profession. You know, I think if you're going to be the best, there's a lot of sacrifice that comes with it. And, and, you know, I think over time I've, I've tried to learn maybe sometimes the hard way, maybe sometimes being wise. Uh, that you can strike a balance, you know, you can be all in, you just got to learn how to, to work smart and, and know when you've got to put your full attention onto something. Uh, but you know, I, I really think Garrett that a lot of swimmers, a lot of families appreciate a coach that has balance in their life. I think if a coach is only thinking about swimming and is only talking about swimming, uh, maybe they miss out a little bit on getting to know the swimmer in a different way. Uh, and, and understanding that, you know, we don't have to always hit a certain yardage or we don't always have to, to, to fit every box. You know, we, we have to make sure that um, enjoying the process and, and developing relationships that are meaningful. You know, it's, it's amazing to me over my 30 plus years in the business, the, the relationships that I have with swimmers that really weren't the best swimmers or the most all in swimmers. Uh, they were really the ones that, that I guess ultimately over time valued the mentoring and, and the inspiration that came with it. And so I guess it's, it's interesting how you end up impacting people that you really didn't know 
that you did. And so the Gators, when you, when you look at whether it's a six and under or an age grouper or a senior level swimmer, I just like the challenge of, of trying to, trying to, to do something I really haven't done other than like summer league or swim camp. So this is kind of a year round summer league slash swim camp. Uh, so I'm, I'm tapping into some areas that I, I haven't done full time. Yeah. It, it's kind of an interesting situation because I feel like there's, and the swim swam commenters are, you know, the telltale for, you know, what any decision or any news that is made, but you know, there are going to be no negative comments when a, a man with, you know, 30 years of college coaching experience jumps into club. But if you flipped that and let's say, you know, you've coached Olympians, you've put people on Olympic teams, you've been, you know, ACC coach of the year over six times or at least six times, you've got all the accolades, which is another part of the question I want to kind of dive into in our time here today. It's easy to say it's all about the relationships when you've got all the benchmarks already on your resume. But sorry, let's get to this question. Why is it more controversial when a club coach that has the experience and the accolades at that level jumps to college versus what, you know, you just basically laid out. This is a brand new challenge. You've never done this this way, but with your college experience, for some reason in our profession, that jump doesn't seem as drastic. Why do you think that is? Well, that's a, that's a good question. You know, and I, I guess the easiest thing, you know, when you look at maybe say Bob Bowman, who, had such a thriving club career and, and did so many amazing things. And now he's gone into to college swimming. And I think he's, you know, made a, a tremendous jump to it. Um, you know, so I, I, why is it that way? I don't know. But, you know, the thing you look at, ultimately, it's, it's the ability to mentor and inspire people to do their best. You know, and I think you look at, like, for example, Bruce Marchanda, who had such a thriving career and what he's doing right now at the club level, you know, and it, I guess it really isn't so much if a club coach goes to college, it's really, Garrett, in my opinion, what is it that they're bringing to the table? And, and what is it that, that gives them an opportunity to thrive at the college level? The college game has really evolved so much, and there's so much more to it now. And, and you know, maybe going back to, to club, I, I do think there's a little bit of a refreshing uh, component to what I'm experiencing now, right, right now at the club level, uh, certainly no disrespect to college because it's, it's my genetics, you know, it's something that I've always have loved and, and have admired. But, you know, I think, I think the club level is a little bit more pure right now. And, uh, you know, and if you can get these parents to, to push in the same direction, uh, you know, I think they really take a lot of the burden off, you know, Garrett, I would dread Monday mornings you know, because you're coming on off the weekend and, and who knows what happens at the college level with these young people and decisions they made. And, Hey, I'm no one to talk. I went to LSU in the 1980s. So, uh, you know, I'm sure Sam freeze was, uh, wringing his hands every Monday morning coming into work. So, you know, I just think you really have to have special wiring, uh, to get into that college game right now. And, uh, you know, I think a lot of these college, these club coach coaches who go in, uh, they certainly are well versed uh, in the swimming component of it, but boy, to to really do the job um, at the college level with with student athletes, it really takes a, a special type of mentor and leader. Got it. I want to hear about that, um, but let's keep at the club level for the time being. What is the plan um, for you to add? your unique perspective to the Virginia Gators. What are you going to do with the group? I guess you can let us know which group you're coaching. Um, and then, you know, your plan to implement your own uh, you know, perspective and touch into the club and start with the group that you're coaching, which I'm assuming would be the top high school group. And then if you could even go into how you plan to impact those younger groups, those, you know, 10 and under groups and how you want to see a progression um, you know, in this new challenge, how do you, how do you see the first year here of transition with you implementing what you hope to be your system? Yeah, good question. Well, first of all, you know, I'm, I'm effectively the new coach, uh, on the heels of Doug Fonder, who was there for 33 years and, and had so much success and, and, you know, really was the reason why that that pool, you know, the Gators have their own indoor 50, uh, 
25 yard pool, eight lanes, excuse me. And we also have a 50 meter uh, outdoor pool that we run in the summer. And so, you know, Doug is a, a legend of what he created and really fast swimming. So anytime you're the next person, uh, you know, it, it sets up its own series of challenges. And, you know, and, and I keep saying to the swimmers, you know, I owe it to you to be me. I owe it to you to, to give you my best and, and do it the way I know, uh, which is certainly going to have some, some new components to it. Garrett, what I'm doing right now, there's, there's uh, the three full-time coaches uh, within our program are doing team coaching. So I've, I've had my fair share of coaching the age groupers uh, and the, uh, the senior groups. So I, I really have spread myself around. I think it's important that I know everybody's name on that roster. I think anytime a, a seven-year-old or a six-year-old uh, says, hi, Coach Ned, um, that means something to me. You know, I don't want to just be that guy that comes on the deck. And you've known me a long time. I'm, I'm more of a, a humble guy. And, and I try to, to just make sure each person knows that I care about them and understand how they did in their softball game or in their, in their baseball game. We've got, you know, four or five different kids playing junior golf, which is something that I love because I'm a junior golf dad, probably number one right now. And, uh, you know, and I, I think if I can get the, each group to know that we're all in this together, I think it helps build a camaraderie that's very important. I think the parents see it. I think the board sees it. And ultimately, we're trying to all speak the same Gator language. And, uh, you know, because when you have a new staff and new coaches and it's different and it's new, you know, you want them to quickly buy in, you know, because this day and age and rapid fire social media or TikTok or things like that, I really think kids are taught to, to question things or not like things. And, and, and this, to me, is a real challenge for me to be able to say, hey, you need to buy into the Virginia Gators. You need to buy into our direction and, and these coaches and what we're trying to do to help you swim fast. Is there anything specific beyond, and I completely agree, although it is a challenge, I'm not sure how many members the Virginia Gators have, but you know, if you're remembering 200 kids times two parents each, that becomes a challenge. And I think nothing goes further than really committing to that because in that process, you are going to get to know people. But is there anything else specifically that you can um, point to that help you in this transition um, to establish that? Because yeah, you do want them to buy in but you want them to choose to buy in. You don't want, and you're not the type to ever do this, but a lot of coaches are like, uh, either get on or get off the bus. You know, it's yeah. kind of one of those things. Like I, I completely agree, Ned, you are humble. You are, you know, very down to earth and caring. And I think that that does go a long way. And I think that your connections within the sport and relationships that you build would all attest to that. But getting a, 15 year old kid to know that is a little bit trickier, you know, cause they're still going to meet you with that wall of, Oh, this dad aged guy, you know, <laughs> what does he know? He's not going to, I'm not going to let him know he's funny. Even if you're hilarious, they're not going to let you know. Um, what do you do to get them to buy in to, to that person who isn't going to force them to buy in? That's a good question. Well, I do spend a fair amount of time with the senior groups. So, you know, I am working with the age groupers and, and I, you know, I'm probably spending more time on the pool deck than I have in a long, long time. And, uh, and it, you know, again, it's going back to my, my basics, going back to my grassroots, but you know, like little things, I think Garrett, that, that I'm trying to do to, to help them understand I'm in it with them. So every day, you know, we'll do a little light warm up as a family, uh, you know, probably about 600, 800. And then we'll hop out and I'll take them through a little stretching routine. And then I, I knock out 20 push-ups with them and I'm counting them out and they see me down there doing it. And, uh, you know, they, they know that, that I'm willing to do things that I'm asking them to do. No different than we're starting from the basics with our drills. We're starting from the basics with helping them know why we're doing good streamlines and, and really educating them uh, along the way. And I think kids really question less when they hear the plan, when they understand what it is that I'm trying to do. And I've said from the very beginning, in April and in the beginning parts of May, I just want to get to know you. I just want you to understand how I think you need to, to do a streamline. I want you to understand why we do some things to send. Um, and it's not just to, to throw you curveballs or, or different entities. It's for you to understand 
why it is that we are doing things. I've had them fill out goal sheets. And I've asked them questions, not just what you want to go. I think that's just easy for people to throw a number down. But how did we get to where we are now? You know, what interest do you have outside of the pool? You know, what is it that, that you want to see out of your program? And I think if we can get swimmers to take real ownership into their team, you know, I think a lot of programs love to say that they're a family, okay? But really to get a program that where swimmers within the team support each other and actually are cheering for each other, I mean, that, that is something that is a, a fine art as far as I'm concerned. And, and even when we get into the weight room and we have a strength coach coming through, you know, I'm going through those exercises with them. And I, it's not so I can get my own workout in and be sloppy. I, I want them to know that it's important to me to have the right form and to show them that I really care about exactly what they're doing and that everything has a purpose. I, Garrett, one other thing is I believe in what's called a symphony of greatness. Kelly Demeray taught me it as a student athlete about 15 years ago. And everything that you do in swimming, whether it's your nutrition or your academics or your personal life or your family, and of course your training, and all those things are basically like an instrument. And when they all play together, you make beautiful music. But if all of a sudden some of those components are out of tune or you're not paying attention to it, you get a little sloppy. And then next thing you know, uh, your performances struggle. So those are the types of things. I'm more of an educator by nature, I think. Uh, but I certainly try to do it without being a wear out. Such good stuff. Before we transition into hopefully, I guess, a little bit more college conversation and how you kind of came to this humble, what seems like egoless approach to, uh, to coaching, which I'm sure is a struggle and I want to hear about that. But before we transition on, because you are in this transition mode, will you give us one drill, your favorite drill? I won't even put a stroke on it so you can choose a stroke. I was a backstroker. I know you were a breaststroker. Whatever you want to do, give me one drill that you're teaching everybody at the Virginia Gators right now that's really good and tell us why you guys are doing it. All right. Thank you. Well, I, I created, this is Freestyle Garrett, so it, I call it NTS, Ned Terribly Cool Skinner. All right. Although that's not my middle name, but we let people think that. And uh, so really, you know, I feel in, in swimming, modern day swimming, you know, the leg drive is just so important, you know, and, and establishing good kick. And that's why I really don't use a pull boy very often these days. I, I do understand the value of it. I think some swimmers like to use it, but it's just something that I've gone away with. So this drill is 425s. You can do it on 30, 35 or 40. Uh, whatever you like. I typically go on about 35. I, we take the kickboard and with a snorkel on and you put your left hand in the center of the board and you're going right arm down for the first one. Okay. And you're just oh, really just, uh, you have your hand, left hand on the center of the board out in front of you. Yeah. Okay. And then, yeah, you're just working on good uh, kicking uh, and a big opened up stroke. Got okay. It. Long and smooth. And then coming back, we do, we, we alternate the arms. So you put your right arm, right hand in the center of the board, and then you swim with your left arm. Okay. And, and the nice thing with a snorkel, you really are getting a good line. You've got good steady kick. We're putting it on an easiest, uh, an easy enough interval where you can keep that stroke opened up. And I'm very particular about it. I think in the early stages, you've got to, uh, You've got to hold them up and you've got to say, this is exactly what we're looking for because leg drive drives the train. Legs bring you home in a race. So right, left, and then you put your board up and then you still have your snorkel on. And then this is the key, overkick. All right, I'm a big believer in doing overkick. I would say 80% of the swimmers that I work with, whether it was at Virginia Tech, we were doing this drill here. So anyone who knows me knows this drill that works with me in the pool. Uh, but that overkick, you've really got to slow down that turnover. You've got to control your arms by a big monster kick. And so the overkick is the most important part of it. And then the fourth one coming home, Garrett, is to do it uh, swimming, but again, trying to keep that stroke in line and applying the components that you did on numbers one through three. So 425s on, one, on uh, 35 seconds, NTS. I like it. I like it. I'm a big proponent of, I, I feel like that drill keeps them from over rotating 
um, cause it forces them to be stable and on top of the stroke, which I think is a place that people really fall into trouble with freestyle. So I like to call it edge kick, but the board kind of forces you to stay on your edge and edge was born from uh, a despise for sidekick because too many people were getting lazy with their rotation and throwing their hips and shoulders underneath them because they were able to rotate that way. And from years of practice, this became very lazy. So, uh, yeah, I like that because that board is going to force you to kind of keep 45 degrees at the most, plus keeping that leg drive. Cool. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and, yeah, cool. and Garrett, and if I might add, when I was at Hollins, you know, previously, Division three school, and uh, I just can't believe how much these women were able to open up their stroke. And, and, you know, once you get your freestyle established and it feels good, that's what leads you to your other strokes. So, you know, that's one reason why I like to do drills in the, in the early part of practice. And uh, because I think once you get your freestyle under control and it feels good, the next thing you know, your butterfly feels better or your backstroke. So I always think that, you know, putting a little extra time into the drills, yes, you're going to decrease your yardage in the overall practice, but I think you are setting the tone for these kids to be mindful of their technique because we know that that's what gets sloppy as you get tired. Yeah. You start to add the work. So foundational stuff from that NTS <laughs> drill. Thank you, Ned. Let's uh, move on to the college conversation. You brought up Hollins just now. So let's start there. What surprised you about Division three college swimming um, that, you know, you didn't experience at Division one level? I, I admire the balance that the student athletes at Division three have. You know, I think one of the most fun things I was able to do was to go to a, a symphony orchestra uh, presentation of three of my swimmers who were, who were in the, in the band, if you will. And, uh, you know, they had to miss a couple practices throughout the course of the fall. Uh, but, you know, when I was sitting in the audience listening to them play, I was just so proud of them. And I think in Division Three, you know, the, the true value placed on if somebody would hold a, an extra job in the library or, or somebody needs to work um, at Dunkin' Donuts to, to make ends meet or, or things like that and, and the, the support that they get through the university and through – the athletic department uh, to, to do the things that outside of being a student and outside of being a swimmer um, was really refreshing, to be honest with you. You know, in all my years at, at Division One, you know, it was all really boiled down to, to rocking it in the classroom and rocking it in the pool, you know, and, and trying to represent your school. But that was pretty much all we had time for, you know. And I, I really have come to admire the Division Three model. I, I think it's a tremendous uh, opportunity. And I know even as I'm starting to talk a bit about college swimming uh, to the Gators, you know, I say, you know, you're really just looking for an environment. You're just looking for an environment that works right for you. That doesn't have to be the number one ranked school in Division One swimming. It, it could be a Division Two or a Division Three or NAIA. It doesn't really matter. It's just what fits your model. And I think too many kids get hung up on, you know, if they see a kid signed early or whatever, and then it freaks them all out. And, you know, you just have to be patient because ultimately you will find that right spot. It just takes you a little bit of time and a little bit of work. Since you started the recruiting conversation, you are going to be such a valuable resource for those Gators as they come up through the ranks, being able to, you know, guide them. What other one tip, if you could give us one more other than, you know, don't get hung up on status of division, which I completely agree. So many of these kids are just looking for that recognizable school so that they get the status of that decision. And they're missing out on a lot better college swimming and college period experience by not even considering a big portion of them on top of keeping their mind open to divisions and, you know, NAIA and any of those things. Um, what else would you make sure that each of your kids at the Gators knew as they're going through the recruiting process? Well, I would say, you know, as you look at where you are, you know, what year are you in school? Where are your times? And, and what is the realistic expectations for you? You know, and, and I, I remember when I was, was coaching at Virginia Tech and you could, you could start to hear kids talking certain talk. And, and I, you know, I would, I'd say, are you going to go to the college that's the cheapest? Or are you going to go to the college that fits 
best for you. And, and every, every swimmer in high school or what have you seems to have their own mandatory items. And sometimes it's the cost of attendance. Sometimes they want to study engineering or what have you. And, and that needs to be, you know, really a, a, an honest approach by the family, you know, and, and I think some kids get very frustrated if, if they see these schools, like their number one school signing kids. But the bottom line is that is a, a real situation. And I think sometimes, you know, you got to look at it like maybe you're not going to be able to go to your number one choice, but guess what? Life will go on. There's a lot of other schools out there. And, and I think my advice to a, a, a parent or a swimmer is to say, all right, where is that school, you know, in, in terms of their recruiting, you know, how many swimmers is it that they're looking to fill that spot? And are they trying to get these classes lined up early? You know, in Division One, it's not uncommon to start seeing sophomores and juniors go uh, very early. And, and as a prospect, you have to understand that that's the way they're recruiting. Some recruit very aggressively. And you just have to know that that means there may not be a spot for you. But on the other hand, if you just take care of yourself and have faith, you're going you're gonna to land somewhere. And if you need to broaden your search a little bit, then you got to do it. But the squeaky wheel gets the grease, Garrett. You know, and I think if you just keep up with these coaches and sell what you're doing and believe in yourself, you're going to be okay. How do you recognize a good coach from a coach that might not have your best interest at heart? How, are there any red flags that you have for – for your kids as they're talking to a coach trying to get to know them? Cause I know, you know, a lot of the coaches, I'm sure you could give them, you know, a little insight on a lot of those coaches, but you can't know all of the coaches. So is there anything that you recommend, uh, you know, with 30 years of, of experience, just being on and around a pool deck and being around coaches and talking to club coaches over and over again, there has to be something that you have kind of recognized can clue them into what kind of coach yeah. they're dealing with. Garrett, I, I honestly think if a coach only talks about performance and if a if a coach only talks about success, you know, and, and we've done this or we're going to do this and this is exactly what it is. And I, I just think that you're going to find over time that if the performance isn't there at the expectation of the coach, then that does, that means success doesn't occur and everybody defines success differently. And I, I can say honestly that at Holland, some of the success that I felt was watching a, a swimmer drop from 40 seconds in the 50 free down to 31 one. Heck, I got somebody to drop nine seconds in the 50 and, you know, and, and, and find herself and, and have confidence and, and believe where she's going. But again, this is coming from a guy that's been around a long, long time, you know, and, and so I don't need to have the accolades. I don't need to have things. You know, I've learned that for me, it's just a matter of being around people that, that want to be inspired, that want to believe in the process. So I think as a, as a swimmer is trying to identify what's important, it's really, is this coach going to take care of them in their bad day? You know, we can all be a hero on the good day. Um, and I think just trying to ask around and, and ask some coaches or, or maybe try to, to ask fellow club coaches, you know, what is this college coach doing and, and are they are they really treating people the right way? Because that really is important um, because we don't always have the storybook career in college. I think the attrition rate, Garrett, is, is nearly at 60% now. You know, so unfortunately, not everybody gets to have a perfect career. Yeah, what went so well at Virginia Tech for 20 years? Um, and I guess on top of that, at the beginning of Virginia Tech, did you have a little bit more of that results drive? You say that you're not necessarily interested in the accolades, but you've already got all the accolades. Was that, I don't want to say that it's like you're not interested in results, but not driven by results-based leadership and much more servant-based leadership seems to be your style. Has that always been the case or how did it come to this, I guess? Yeah, that's, that's a great question and, and probably one of those that makes you think inside. I mean, of course, to this day, I want to rock it. I, I want to win. I want the Virginia Gators to, to be amazing. You know, I was at ODAC's Old Dominion Athletic Conference with Hollins thinking, 
you know, how am I going to get this program where, where I want to be super competitive in the upper echelons? So, you know, I never want to misspeak and, and say I don't care about results. I feel like the results come when the, when the swimmer, you know, truly understands who they are and they're buying into the cause. Uh, I would say younger on in my career, you know, I probably use methodology and, and ways to light fires under swimmers. Uh, that was probably a little bit more old school, uh, where, you know, the way you would challenge a swimmer and, and say, you know, you're, you're not doing what you need to be doing. Therefore you will not succeed. Uh, I think trying to speak more in the positive now and having that mental shift of saying, Hey, you know, that you're capable of more than that. And, and I know what you want. So let, let's see if we can bring a little bit more out of this set or this situation. And, and I, I guess it's really the way you speak to people now, you know, and one of our assistant coaches says he doesn't like to yell. I'm like, well, how the heck am I ever supposed to coach? You know, but, but I, I, I think you can get to a swimmer. You can get to a person without yelling. You can inspire that person without having to make them feel crappy, you know, and, and I, I have been a, a, a person that has done that before. I'm not proud of it, uh, but I, I do feel like, uh, at this point, the way I'm grounded, um, I'm just not going to go there. I, I'm going to find a different way uh, to get that person to swim to the wall uh, with a championship finish than, than threatening them with butterfly or threatening them to say, you, you're just, you don't care. That, that, that's just not the way I think modern swimming is going. And, you know, after I left Virginia Tech in these last three years, I, I really have had a chance to, to, to step back and, and, and know what it is that, that is important. And, uh, you know, I think when I go onto the pool deck now, you know, I'm, I'm coaching now on, on my terms and, and not in fear of failure. And, and I think a lot of coaches try to get all this out of them because they don't want to get fired or they don't want to disappoint uh, whatever group it is that oversees their paycheck. Yeah, the fear is at all kinds of levels. And you're going to find the new fear is – the parents, you know, worried about their kids getting the right times and getting those, you know, opportunities and stuff. So there's definitely, you know, elements of that. Um, and I think it's inspiring that I'm seriously, as a young coach, very inspired to get this chance to talk to you. Um, and I really, you know, I, this is the kind of stuff that I agree with. And I think I've also been there where I've tried to get things out of kids in ways that I really look back at and say, man, what an idiot. <laughs> and man, that was an immature way to say things. Um, but that's how we learn. And hopefully, you know, we, we keep that in mind as young coaches come up and try different tactics and whatnot. <sighs> I have two questions really left. What makes a great coach? And you have your doctorate. I, I'm not sure exactly what you got your doctorate in, but if you had a recommendation for coaches to go back and get some education, what area would that be in? Well, I, you know, it's funny. I met with a, a, a young coach who's working with our kids in um, with their golf swing and, and strength and conditioning. And I think if, if you could go back and get more education in biomechanics or anything having to do with sport movement, and the science of sport movement, um, and being able to, to truly understand how the, the technique-driven strokes that we have. I, I think that if, if you look at the next level of swimming, I think in the future, it's being able to maximize each person's ability you know, to, to utilize strength and apply strength in their, in their stroke, or in other words, their kicking you know, as we started talking earlier. And, and so I would, I would put more of a value, uh, not so much to say you have a PhD, to be honest with you, Garrett, I mean, it sounds great. But you know, getting a PhD in education curriculum and instruction is awesome. And I'm super proud of it. But I don't know how every day I'm able to help, you know, a 10 year old swim faster backstroke with that. You know, but I do feel them because you're able to reach them in all of the ways that you've laid out for this last 40 minutes. And I've been inspired by, I think that is part of the root of it. That education has to have opened your eyes for ways to reach people. Sorry to interrupt, but I just, I think that might have something to do with the foundation of what makes you such a great person and coach. But Thank you. Yeah. Well, I, I do appreciate it, but you know, I don't, I just don't slap that on them. And, and I don't have people call me Dr. Ned or any of that stuff. I never have. And, 
you know, you, I always feel you want to earn respect. And, and after all these years, I mean, I'm, I'm doing everything I can to earn the, the respect of these, of these young swimmers and of the parents. And I'm not begging for it. I'm not talking about it. I just try to do it because I figure if they respect me, then I'll be able to respect them in return. And, you know, they, I don't ask for people to earn my respect, but I know deep down they need to. And, uh, you know, if, if they want to get all of me, then, then there needs to be respect on both sides. Yeah. You have certainly earned it as a great coach. What is, that's my second question there. And pretty much, I think what I've got is, you know, what makes a great coach? How do you know a great coach when you see it? And you kind of helped lay it out, you know, when they talk about results for the kids as recruits, but when you're looking at a coach, maybe to, you know, hire when you were looking back in college days or hire now as, you know, an assistant or age group coach or whatever, what are you looking for that, that makes a good coach? I, well, first of all, I, I'm, I'm looking for a coach that is kind. I'm looking for a coach that, that respects others. You know, it's, a, it's interesting, Garrett. I spent a lot of years at NC2As. I, I'm one of those guys that if I see a good swim from another team, whether it's at the conference meet or NC2As or even in a dual meet, I'll go over to the coach and say, hey, great job. You know, boy, you really got that, that team rocking it or that swimmer rocking it. And then if that coach just goes on and, and spouts off for 10 minutes about uh, the amazing training cycle that they've done and all the amazing co- accomplishments and, you know, it doesn't even take a second to, to say thank you or, you know, appreciate you noticing or, hey, Ned, your, your swimmer's are looking pretty good. I know where that coach really is. And when I walk away from that, I, I bank that information. And, um, you know, I, I always value – a fellow coach that that cares about all the things going on in swimming, not just the only great things that they're doing in swimming. And I think Garrett always trying to learn. And you know, you and I have talked about this previously that you know we all go through ups and downs. We all have our story, uh, but it's a matter of of how you apply that story today, you know, and and how you go about your business of of trying to be a good person and. You know, and, and I guess for me, being a good coach means that, that you care about the totality of, of what we do, not just how fast somebody swims. And I certainly know the, the value of that. Uh, but I know the, the coaches that I've surrounded myself with at the Gators, they're, they're good people. They're people that I like to be with off the pool deck. They're the people I like to hear about, you know, talking, you know, things outside of swimming. So I, I, I never want to be one dimensional. Growth mindset, servant leader, checking all of my favorite boxes. Dr. Skinner, (laughs) I really appreciate your time very much. It has been a pleasure catching up with you. It sounds like the Gators have got a fantastic future ahead with you in charge leading the way. Um, And I hope that you find that, you know, that balance. I know that early on in the transition, you got to be putting a lot more work on, like you said, a lot more time on deck, but. I am also a proponent of that uh, club coach work-life balance, and I think that it is doable, and they are uh, lucky to have you, um, and it sounds like it's a good position for your family, too, so I appreciate your time. Yeah, thank you, Garrett. I appreciate you and uh, all the great things Swim Swam does for our, our swimming community and uh, the, the leading news source in uh, information. That's right. Thanks to coaches and uh, viewers like yourself. Ned, take care. Best of luck here this summer going into uh, long course season. Thank you. All the best. You've been listening to the Swim Swam podcast. Stay tuned for new episodes every week. You can take Swim Swam podcast on the go by subscribing on your favorite podcast platform. Look for links in the description below and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more videos as well.